Hello friends, today we're going to be looking at a divide that appears to separate the Christian and Islamic communities. And this is in particular regarding the crucifixion of Jesus Christ in the Quran. Often it is stated that the Quran denies the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, and when one reads the passage in question, we can understand how someone would take that understanding away from it. However, we want to look at that passage, other passages from the Quran, and some of the passages from the Baha'i Scripture. So friends, regarding this presentation, please note that the actual answer to this is going to be about 30 minutes, and then subsequent to that we're going to look at some of the Arabic terms used in this phrase related to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ in the Quran. Uh, please remember that this is just a personal opinion coming from myself. Uh, for official Baha'i perspectives and actual official Baha'i scriptures, please go to Baha'i.org. And also remember that underneath this video is actually an audio recording of this talk and all of the references used there. Thank you very much. Here is the actual text in question. This is from chapter 4, verse 157. And they're saying, Surely we have killed the Messiah, Isa, son of Maryam, the Apostle of Allah. And they did not kill him, nor did they crucify him, but it appeared to them so. And most surely those who differ therein are only in a doubt about it. They have no knowledge respecting it, but only follow a conjecture. And they killed him not for sure. Nay, Allah took him up to himself, and Allah is mighty, wise. And there is not one of the followers of the book, but most certainly believes in this before his death, and on the day of resurrection, he, Esau, shall be a witness against them. So in this passage we hear several things. They did not kill him, nor did they crucify him. They killed him not for sure. So reading this passage immediately it sounds, wow, this central concept within the Quran, sorry, within the New Testament, which is the crucifixion, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, appears to actually be outright denied by the Quran. If so, this would cause an irreparable division between the two communities. At the same time, I think it's important to note that there is a diversity of opinions within Islam. For example, I myself lived in the Middle East and had friends who were Muslim who upon reading this couldn't understand why other individuals believed this denied the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, which may sound strange having just heard the passage. But there is another way to read it, and there are Muslims that do so. This brings us to an important issue which we touch on in the Unity of Religion video, where we explore avenues of actually unifying belief systems. Which is that you can have individuals within a community, even a large group of individuals, that believe something, yet that's not actually the purport or intention of the scripture itself. I urge you to please take a moment at some time to actually look at that video. So here, yes, I've met Muslims myself, who actually do not believe this to be a statement that the crucifixion never happened. I want to take a moment to look at a couple other passages from the Qur'an. This other passage is actually from the Qur'an, chapter 3, verses 47 to 49, and then verse 54. And he will teach him the scripture and wisdom, and the Torah and the gospel, and will make him a messenger unto the children of Israel. Lo, I come unto you with a sign from your Lord. Lo, I fashion for you out of clay the likeness of a bird, and breathe into it, and it is a bird, by Allah's leave. I heal him who was born blind and the leper, and I raise the dead by Allah's leave. And I announce unto you that what ye eat and what ye store up in your houses, lo, here and verily is a portent for you, if you are to be believers. And I come confirming that which was before me of the Torah, and to make lawful some of that which was forbidden unto you. I come unto you with a sign from your Lord, so keep your duty to Allah and obey me. In verse 54, And remember when Allah said, O Jesus, lo, I am gathering thee and causing thee to ascend unto me, and am cleansing thee out thee of those who disbelieve, and am setting those who follow thee above those who disbelieve until the day of resurrection. Then unto me... Ye will return, and I shall judge between you, as to that wherein ye used to differ." In this section of the Qur'an, it appears to clearly state that it was God who caused Jesus to ascend. Now oftentimes, 
Uh, this is incorporated within to certain Muslims' beliefs, where Jesus Christ was never crucified, but was actually, if you will, assumed up into heaven. Yet here it is clearly the plan and purpose of God to bring Jesus Christ up. And they say, O Mary, thou hast come with an amazing thing. O sister of Aaron, thy father was not a wicked man, nor was thy mother a harlot. Then she pointed to him. They said, How can we talk to one who is in the cradle, a young boy? He spake, Lo, I am the slave of Allah. He hath given me the scripture, and hath appointed me a prophet, and hath made me blessed wheresoever I may be, and hath enjoined upon me prayer almsgiving so long as I remain alive, and hath made me dutiful towards her who bore me, and hath not made me arrogant, unblessed. Peace on me the day I was born, and the day I die, and the day I shall be raised alive. Such was Jesus, son of Mary. This is a statement of the truth concerning which they doubt. It says, Peace be upon me the day I was born, and the day I die, and the day I shall be raised alive. So clearly in the Quran it's speaking of how Jesus Christ is born, is somehow dies, and somehow is then raised. And previously, in the passage just quoted before, it is stated that it is God's plan to actually raise Jesus Christ up. Yet this is exactly what the New Testament actually does teach. That it was the plan of God that Jesus Christ be crucified, died, and raised again. So barring any questions as to whether this is true or not, the Quran itself actually seems to almost exactly confirm, or I would say exactly confirm, what the New Testament says. Jesus Christ was a messenger from God. He was the Spirit of God. He came into this world, was killed, and was then raised. I think, too, that this, this point bears some real consideration, because from a common, the most common Christian perspective, be it Protestant, be it Catholic, or Greek Orthodox, or Russian Orthodox for that matter, the idea is that Jesus Christ was as a lamb sent into the world, that it was God's plan that he be sacrificed for the sins of the world. Now this might get us into a deep you know, a discussion into the nature of actually salvation within the Christian doctrine, yet it seems very clear that on the surface Christianity proclaims that Jesus Christ was raised up by God as a sacrifice for the sins of the world. But in these two passages we just quoted, we hear that he was raised up by God and that he would actually knew that he would die on the day he would, was born, the day he would die, and the day he would be raised. Now let us see, momentarily, some symbol quotes from the Baha'i Writings. The crucifixion is recounted and the New Testament is correct. The meaning of the Quranic verse is that the Spirit of Christ was not crucified. There is no conflict between the two. Next, regarding your question relative to Surah 4, 156 of the Quran, in which Muhammad says that the Jews did not crucify Jesus, the Christ, but one like him, what is meant by this passage is that although the Jews succeeded in destroying the physical body of Jesus, yet they were impotent to destroy the divine reality in him. In both of these quotes from Shoghi Effendi, the guardian of the Baha'i faith, it is stated that Jesus Christ was in fact crucified, which appears to be confirmed by the Quran itself. And yet, that that was not his true reality, but which is only his appearance, his manifestation within this world, but that his divine reality continued to live on. That the body of Christ, the spirit of Christ, continued to affect the world, and also continued to exist within the realms above. I think this is important to consider when we look at the original quote from Surah 4. Because at the very end, when it says that any of the people of the book will recognize that they did not actually kill Jesus Christ. The quote is 4.159, And there is not one of the followers of the book, but most certainly believes in this before his death. What is the this that it's talking about? That they did not truly kill Jesus Christ. But how is it that a Jewish individual could assuredly come to about the people of the book, come to a position where they would have to acknowledge, if they are a person of the book, that Jesus Christ was not killed, that he was not crucified? I think it's very clear, because they themselves, if they are a person of the book and are on their deathbed, they are recognizing that actually there is a continuation of existence after the death of the physical frame. That in fact they did not kill Jesus. I think now when we return back to the quote, which I think we should, we find that there is a different way to read this. 
that is actually commensurate and congruent with the New Testament itself. Which is this, they did not really kill him. They did not actually crucify him, because the reality of Jesus Christ, his true reality, which was the Logos, or the Word of God, as spoken of in the beginning of the Gospel of John, that is the true reality, and that itself cannot die. And that Jesus Christ himself lived on and continued to affect this earth. Now this is the purport of the Quran, that it is denying the actual crucifixion of Jesus Christ in its spiritual reality. And they're saying, surely we have killed the Messiah, Isa, son of Maryam, the Apostle of Allah. And they did not kill him, nor did they crucify him, but it appeared to them so. And most surely those who differ therein are only in a doubt about it. They have no knowledge respecting it, but only follow a conjecture. And they killed him not for sure. Nay, Allah took him up to himself, and Allah is mighty, wise. In order to understand this concept better from a Christian perspective, or in fact a Jewish perspective, I want to actually read from the Book of Wisdom. Now the Book of Wisdom is from the Old Testament. And not only is it from the Old Testament, but it is actually from what is often referred to as the Apocrypha. The Apocrypha are a certain collection of books that you would find, for example, within a Catholic Bible, or within an Orthodox Bible, but which are not accepted by the majority of Protestant Christians. Does this then apply to Protestant Christianity? I think necessarily it does. <laughs> Even if one does not accept the Apocrypha itself, which includes the Book of Wisdom, these were the texts that informed the Christian community throughout the millennia. That it was not until the advent of Martin Luther, within the 16th century, that we finally actually have a removal of these books. Which is a different topic. <laughs> but for now, we have to acknowledge that Christians, for well over a thousand years, actually were reading these texts, and the Jews themselves read these texts. And they themselves would have to square their understanding of the world with such passages. Before we begin, Please pay close attention to the theme of this passage. It's somewhat long. For the ungodly said, reasoning with themselves, but not aright, our life is short and tedious, and in the death of a man there is no remedy. Neither was there any man known to have returned from the grave. So the ungodly reason in error. That life is short, there's no remedy to death, and that no man has ever returned from the grave. Verse 2. For we are born at all adventure, and we shall be hereafter as though we had never been, for the breath in our nostrils is as smoke and little spark in the moving of our heart, which being extinguished, our body shall be turned to ashes, and our spirit shall vanish as the soft air. And our name shall be forgotten in time, and no man shall have our works in remembrance, and our life shall pass away as the trace of a cloud, and shall be dispersed as a mist that is driven away with the beams of the sun, and overcome with the heat thereof. For our time is a very shadow that passeth away, and after our end there is no returning, for it is fast sealed, so that no man cometh again. So here from uh, chapter 2, verses 2, all the way up to verse 5, it is speaking specifically that this life is the only life, that there is nothing beyond this. We will be as we have never been that our breath is, shall be as smoke, a little spark moving from our heart, that our spirit shall vanish as the soft air. The passage then continues. Come on, therefore, let us enjoy the good things that are present, and let us speedily use the creatures like as in youth. Let us fill ourselves with costly wine and ointments, and let no flower of the spring pass by us. Let us crown ourselves with rosebuds before they be withered, let none of us go without his part of our voluptuousness. Let us leave tokens of our joyfulness in every place. For this is our portion, and our lot is this. In hearing these people speak, they're saying, well, as in the first section, in the second section, there's nothing to our life. There is no spirit that continues. So, therefore, do what? It says... Enjoy the good things, drink wine, cover our bodies with beautiful things, enjoy the voluptuous, voluptuousness, and do what we can and spread our joy. 
basically, um, you only live once, live life to its fullest, enjoy whatever sensual pleasures you can, for once this life is gone, it is all over. We now continue. Let us oppress the poor righteous man. Let us not spare the widow, no reverence the ancient gray hairs of the aged. Let us strength be in the law of justice, for that which is feeble is found to be nothing worth. Therefore let us lie in wait for the righteousness, because he is not for our turn, and he is clean contrary to our doings. He upbraideth us with our offending the law, and objecteth to our infamy, the transgressing of our education. He professeth to have the knowledge of God, and he calleth himself the child of the Lord. He was made to reprove our thoughts. He is grievous even unto us to behold. For his life is not like other men's. His ways are of another fashion. We are esteemed of him as counterfeit. He abstaineth from our ways as from filthiness. He pronounceth the end of the just to be blessed, and maketh his boast that God is his father. We have the claim that given that there is no real justice, let our justice be the law of justice, for nothing that is feeble has any worth. That we should therefore then oppress the righteous, take advantage of the widow. If you will, use our strength and power wherever we can to gain what we need. And we should lie in wait for the righteous, because he actually speaks of us offending the law of justice, the true law of justice. And that he himself reproves us and admonishes us for our wickedness. And he claims, or makes the boast, that God is his Father. Now, for any individual steeped in the Christian tradition, reading actually the Book of Wisdom, this sounds to be actually about Jesus Christ. We'll get back to that later. Let us continue for now. Verse 17. Let us see if his words be true. Let us prove what shall happen in the end of him. For if the just man be the Son of God, he will help him, and deliver him from the hand of his enemies. Let us examine him with despitefulness and torture, that we may know his meekness, and prove his patience. Let us condemn him with a shameful death, for by his own saying he shall be respected. Such things they did manage, imagine, and were deceived, for their own wickedness hath blinded them. As for the mysteries of God, they knew them not, neither hoped they for the wages of righteousness, nor discerned a reward for blameless souls. For God created man to be immortal, and made him to be an image of his own eternity. Nevertheless, through envy of the devil came death into the world, and they that do hold of his side do find it. So concerning this righteous man, the wicked, the unrighteous, the unjust are here saying, well, let's test him. Let's actually see if his words are true. For if he is the Son of God, he will be delivered from his enemies. Let us use torture. Let us actually see if we can test his meekness. Let us condemn him with a shameful death. For by his own saying, he shall be respected. So this individual is stating that he will be honored and glorified. Well, let's actually condemn him with a shameful death to see if his words are true. But these individuals here in the, in the Book of Wisdom were deceived. Why? Because they knew not the mysteries of God, which are what? God created man to be immortal. and made him to be an image of his own eternity. Nevertheless, through envy of the devil came death into the world. And this sounds a great deal like Paul. <laughs> The Apostle Paul, that through envy and evil, death came into the world. But here it's stating that the reality of mankind is actually eternal. We are in the image of his eternity. Now it actually switches into chapter 3. But the souls of the righteous are in the hand of God, and there shall no torment touch them. In the sight of the unwise, they seem to die, and their departure is taken for misery, and they're going from us to be utter destruction, but they are in peace. For though they be punished in the sight of men, yet is their hope full of immortality, 
and having been a little chastised, they shall be greatly rewarded. For God proved them, and found them to be worthy for Himself. As gold in the furnace hath He tried them, and received them as a burnt offering. And in the time of their visitation they shall shine, and run to and fro like sparks among the stubble. They shall judge the nations, and have dominion over the people, and their Lord shall reign forever. So what are we told? This righteous one, who claims to be the Son of God, that God is his Father, and the righteous ones in general, in the sight of the unwise, seemed to die, and their departure is taken for misery. They are going from us utter destruction, but they are in peace. Now, when it says that it was only a likeness, or it seemed like they died, but they didn't, did a Jewish individual, or a Christian individual reading this passage, take this to mean that the individual was never actually killed? No. I think it's taken exactly the way the passage in chapter 4 of the Quran, verse 156, 157, is taken to be. Which is, yes, it seems like he was crucified. It seems like he died. But actually he didn't. Why? Because, for though they be punished in the sight of men, yet is their hope full of immortality. Yes, they've been chastised, but in reality they've been greatly rewarded. So there's this difference within the Quran, and actually within the Book of Wisdom, which is Jewish and Christian scripture, that there is this appearance on one hand, and on the other side, the reality. That the appearance is what we see within the physical world, yet the reality is something different. The appearance, that is, that he was crucified, the appearance is that the Jews actually killed him. In reality, he lived on as a symbol and sign of the eternity of God Himself, and continues to abide. That in reality, they are in the hands of God, as it says in the Book of Wisdom, and they are being greatly rewarded, for it is God who brought them up. For why? For it says, As gold in the furnace, He, God, hath tried them, and received them as an offering. So, when we look at the original, if you will, offending passage from the Quran, which states, that he did not really die, that he wasn't really crucified, we can actually hear the echoes and rhythms of the Book of Wisdom, which is itself Christian and Jewish scripture. So that they themselves, the people of the Book, can actually think in their own heart and mind, if they are still believers on their deathbed, that they themselves, if you will, are actually a sign of his eternity. That they themselves are not actually dying, but that is the appearance. It is the appearance that the breath of their nostrils is all that there is. It is only appearance that it is utter destruction. It is only appearance that it's utter degradation, when in reality they continue on. So the Quran itself really doesn't say anything different, in my mind, than the Christian and Jewish scriptures says. This is why when in this passage I said at the beginning that I didn't have a great deal of, of empathy for this objection. Even though I do understand how on the surface it can look, it is very easy to actually read the Quran and actually see it as saying, that is not the true, true Jesus, that is not the true Christ. The reality of Christ continued on. And I will be honest that when I first read this passage, that is actually how I read it. I did not take the Quran to be rejecting the New Testament narrative. I think there is another aspect to actually consider here. One of my friends once said to me, upon discussing this topic, okay, sure, I understand maybe there is a way to read it, and we can actually read it in such a way that we can see that the Quran is not actually rejecting the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, but is looking at the physical body of Jesus Christ as a mere emblem or appearance or likeness when his reality is divine. However, the Quran itself 
does not, if you will, circle around the very person of Jesus Christ and the nature of the crucifixion? Why did it not make it entirely central to the narrative of the Quran if, in fact, this actually was a message from God? And I can understand at the outset how this might seem, because when you actually read the New Testament, you walk through four Gospels. Those four Gospels centering on the person of Jesus and centering around, or if you will, climaxing in His crucifixion, death and resurrection. And then the Epistles themselves really sort of, if you will, circumambulate around this concept of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. So when a Christian actually approaches the Quran and doesn't see this as the central theme, it seems jarring. It seems like something, well, this couldn't actually be from the same author. And I said to my friend, I, I do understand this. At the same time, please actually look, if you can, at the New Testament from the perspective of a Jew, an individual who is a disciple of Moses, one who believes that Moses is the central figure which established the Jewish religion. And in addition, the Mosaic Dispensation circles around the Law of God as given to Moses on Mount Sinai. That this centrality that we actually see within, if you will, the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, is actually completely, if you will, moved away within the New Testament. Because suddenly, you actually no longer have the obeying of the Law. You, have the, you do not have the sacrificial system. You do not actually support the Aaronic priesthood. So when a Christian actually looks at the, new, at the Quran, sorry, and actually sees it not, if you will, revolving around the person of Jesus Christ, it's important to understand that the New Testament itself shift, shifted, if you will, that circumambulation, that revolving around Moses and the Law of God to Jesus and the crucifixion. And there's one other point here, that we do actually have a video here on Bridging Beliefs about this. The Quran, I believe if you'll take the time to look into it, is actually very, very clear. It's very, very clear that the New Testament and the Old Testament are actually Scripture. So just like the New Testament, while it has this, if you will, new center of revolution around Jesus Christ and His crucifixion, as opposed to Moses and the Law, the New Testament itself believes that you are actually acknowledging, as it acknowledges, the Old Testament as Holy Scripture. The Quran simply just does this again, where suddenly, yes, there is actually around the ministry of the Prophet Muhammad and what he has come to do, but it actually is in a sense the same thing that happened between Christianity and Judaism. Because within the Quran itself, it clearly states that these prior books are revelation and are to be believed. And if one believes, as the Quran tells them to, that the New Testament, that the Gospel and the Torah are themselves Scripture, it is a natural assumption that one should be reading them. Now this may not, again, just like at the beginning, be the practice and behavior of your Muslim friend, yet that is neither here nor there. The question is, does the Quran state that the New Testament and the Old Testament are Scripture. Yes, it does. Therefore, it is assuming you know the, the story of Jesus Christ, and in fact, it does actually go somewhat out of its way to continue telling stories about Jesus Christ, but also Moses and Abraham, etc. In fact, it seems to tell much more about Jesus than the New Testament tells about Moses. Please take a time, if you can, to look into this. At this point, I would like to say that generally the problem itself is solved. We don't have to have an issue with the Qur'an. We may have found the way it presented its topic confusing. But if you're Christian, either of the Catholic or the Orthodox, uh, if you will, lineage, you have to understand that this is actually the language of the Book of Wisdom. And if you be a Protestant, and do not accept the Book of Wisdom itself, again, it's neither here nor there. This is a passage from the Scriptures of your Christian brothers and sisters that actually informed the Christian community for 1500 years. 
and they themselves would never have read this passage within the Book of Wisdom, where it says they only seemed to die, it was only a likeness, but that's not really what happened, to be a rejection that righteous people are killed. And these kinds of passages are actually the passages that were in the hands of the Jews and the Christians in the days of the Prophet Muhammad. If individuals wish to continue from this point into an exploration more deeply, I welcome you to actually continue on. At this point, we're actually going to look at some of the passages within the Quran that use this term likeness, or it seemed like he died. This is specifically basing it upon the Arabic root itself, and then exploring it from that vantage point. Often there is a great deal of tradition or conventional understanding of certain terms used within Scripture. For example, in the New Testament, when Jesus Christ says that there are two kinds of trees, good trees and bad trees, good prophets and false prophets, and you should know them by their fruits, it's important, for example, to actually look at the use of fruit in the New Testament to understand what it means. The same thing goes for this passage in chapter 4, verse 156 of the Quran, speaking of the crucifixion, and it says that it was only his likeness. Now, what is this actual word that is being used? The root itself comes from shabbaha, which is to make an appearance or likeness of something. And in this case, it's actually in the passive voice. So it is shubbaha. This actually, in fact, is the only place within the Quran that this form is used. However, different forms based on the same root are actually used throughout the Quran. An example is for example, uh, kataba is to write, and katib is a writer, and maktaba could be an office or a place of books. So here we have shabbaha, which is the quote in question. The other one is tashabaha. This comes from Quran chapter 2, verse 70, and it reads like this. They said, Beseech on behalf thy Lord to make plain to us what she is. To us all heifers are alike. We wish indeed for guidance, if Allah wills. In this context, it's talking about the many different kinds of calves that can be used, or heifers, cows, <laughs> um, for the sacrifice in the time of Moses. And it's saying to us, they all have the same appearance, they all have the same likeness, even though they're not identical, and the, the individuals, those who are the disciples of Moses in this day, are asking for guidance to discern between them since they look alike. The next passage comes again from chapter 2, verse 118. Say those without knowledge, why speaketh not Allah unto us, or why cometh not us unto us a sign? So said the people before them, words of similar import, their hearts are all alike. And this likeness is the actual verb form that we see within the likeness of the crucifixion. Here it's actually saying that there is something that unites them, even though they are different, every person's heart and the contents of their mind and heart are different. There is a similarity in that they are asking for God to speak directly to them. This is the similarity. Another passage. This is from the Quran, chapter 13, verse 16. Say, who is the Lord and sustainer of the heavens and the earth? Say, it is Allah. Say, do ye then take for worship protectors other than him, such as have neither power for good or for harm to themselves? Say, are the blind equal with those who see, or the depths of darkness equal with light? Or do they assign to God partners who have created anything as he has created, so that the creation seem to them similar? Say, Allah is the creator of all things, he is the one, the supreme, the irresistible. So here it's saying these individuals are asking who is the Lord and sustainer of the heavens and the earth? What is the cosmic principle behind the realities that we see? And it's saying are they actually stating that there is a creation similar like unto this one that they could judge from? This similarity is once again in the same verb form. We now move to a different category. This regards the principles of types versus tokens. A category of something versus an example. 
This is from Quran 699 and 6141. The first. It is he who sendeth down rain from the skies. With it we produce vegetation of all kinds. For some we produce green crops, out of which we produce grain heaped up at harvest. Out of the date palm in its sheaths come clusters of dates hanging low and near. And then there are gardens of grapes and olives and pomegranates, each similar in kind, yet different in variety. When they begin to bear fruit, feast your eyes with the fruit and the ripeness thereof. Behold, in these things there are signs for people who believe. The second, from 6141, it is he who produces gardens with trellises and without, and dates and tilth with produce of all kinds, and olives and pomegranates similar in kind and different in variety, each of their fruit in their season, but render the dews that are proper on the day that the harvest is gathered. But waste not by excess, for Allah loves not the wasters. So in both of these contexts, it's actually talking about fruit and vegetation, and that they are similar in kind, though different in variety, that there is some underlying principle, some underlying essence which actually unites them. So there is the category, if you will, of grape, or the category of pomegranate, but there are individual tokens of pomegranates or grapes. Just like if I say, this is a classic example, if I say the word dog, 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 how many words have I actually said? From one perspective, I've actually said three words, dog, dog, and dog. From another perspective, the perspective of the type as opposed to the token, I've actually said three words, because I said dog three times. But there is the, if you will, the type, dog, and the tokens of dogs, be they words or actually animals in themselves. We're going to move on, and we'll gather some of these principles together. The next passage is from Surah, or chapter 39, verse 23, and it reads, Allah has revealed from time to time the most beautiful message in the form of a book consistent with itself, yet repeating its teachings in various aspects. So God has revealed from time to time the most beautiful message in the form of a book consistent with itself. So there is a beautiful message, but it comes in multiple books, but it is consistent between these different books, which are the same message. In a sense, there might be various pomegranates, there might be various figs, there might be various dates, but there is in the world dates, pomegranates, and figs. Quickly, we're going to move on. This is from the Quran, verse 3. Sorry, chapter 3, verse 7. He it is who hath sent down to thee a book. In it are verses basic or fundamental, of established meaning. They are the foundation of the book. Others are allegorical. But those in whose hearts is perversity follow the part thereof that is allegorical, seeking discord and searching for its hidden meanings, but no one knows its hidden meanings except Allah. And those who are firmly grounded in knowledge say, We believe in the book, the whole of it is from our Lord, and none will grasp the message thereof except men of understanding. In this passage, the root is actually being used, again similar with likeness, but likeness in the form of allegory as opposed to type or token. And from reading it, it seems to be that people who actually encounter something which is allegorical or placed within symbol, which is drawing a similarity between two things, an analogy or metaphor or simile. And they are taking that part which is difficult to understand and causing contention, whereas that which is clear, they avoid. Whereas the believer says, well, all of this is from our Lord, we should accept it. Pausing for a moment. We then have another passage from chapter 2, verse 25. And this is using fruit, but fruit in a very different way. But give glad tidings to those who believe and work righteousness, that their portion is gardens, 
beneath which rivers flow. Every time they are fed with fruits therefrom, they say, Why, this is what we were fed with before, for they are given things in similitude. And they have herein companions pure and holy, and they abide therein forever. Now, in the first case, it's talking about Kingdom Animalia, and the type, which is, of cattle or heifer, which are separated by the tokens. We saw another category which related to plants, where there is the pomegranate, its type, and pomegranates, their tokens. The difference between a type of word and an instance of a single word, dog, dog, and dog. We then actually looked at there being a uniting property, a property that unites the different hearts of people. That while they may be radically different in variety, there is a similarity in their approach to, if you will, religious or spiritual or truth claims. Then we actually have the question of there being a similar creation. Is there something like unto it? Again, this concept of actually similarity. Then we actually have the instance of an expression of similarity of type, but difference of token, as it relates to the messages of God, from God unto humankind. And if you remember, in this case, it says Allah has revealed from time to time the most beautiful message in the form of a book, consistent with itself. That while there might be varieties from the different forms of fruit, there is one pomegranate, or one fig, or even the concept that they are all some form of fruit. And then it goes to this concept of allegorical, and finishes with a statement, this last quote, about those in the next world, those on the day of God, who will be in gardens, and be given fruits, and they will then say, but this is what we've actually tasted before. And then it tells us why they will actually say this. It says, For they are given things in similitude. This same term. So in each of these cases, it seems to be looking at the difference between, if you will, diversity, the tokens, and the unity, that which unites them. The fruit that is eaten in the gardens of heaven, the message given from time to time, and then it actually uses these different other categories, these various categories of, of fruit, of vegetables, of animals, which on their surface appear different, but in their unity are actually of one type. These are merely the variations one sees in the tokens. So the examples being used with animals, for example, or even the hearts of men, or fruits and vegetables, are, if you will, uh, self-reflexively, a similitude of this other category, which is the revelations of God to humankind. One in the case of being presented in different lamps, but we have a unite, unity of light. That if we have multiple mirrors placed before us, we can see the image of the sun reflected therein, even though the borders of the mirrors might be radically different. And it's stating that there is one message, a message from God unto humankind, that does come in various forms from time to time in the form of a book, and yet it is actually consistent with itself. So when we look at the teachings of the Quran and the use of this term in the various different instances, where the token or the type of word is being used in multiple token places, we find that once again there is a unity of meaning. And this is a fundamental principle expressed within the Baha'i writings of the faith of God, eternal in the past, eternal in the future, though on the surface it can actually differ in form and expression. Please take a look at again at our Unity of Religion video to understand how Baha'is might see this. But when this actually relates to the quote in question, which has to do with the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, we see through something like the Book of Wisdom, which we have already studied, that this is the same fruit. That the, an individual actually first looking at this quote from the Quran 
would say, well, you know, these are, this is completely different. However, when we take our time to explore how it can be read, we can see that actually, like the Book of Wisdom, it's not stating that the righteous are actually never killed. It's simply saying that it is only in similitude, only in likeness, only in appearance, that the righteous are actually punished, that the righteous are actually killed, which is where in reality their very essence is actually in the hand of God and they are at peace with their Lord. So we actually can see that the similarity of fruit that those in paradise are actually eating is related to actually the fact that the message, the message of God unto humankind comes in different books, in different forms, in different tokens, yet it is of one type. So even when we begin to look more deeply into the Quran and actually how it uses the passages in question, and I do please uh, invite you to actually take a look at the PDF that is actually in the link below, to actually really explore these quotes from the Quran to see this difference between types and tokens. Because this really is the essence of what the Baha'i teachings are regarding the manifestation of God. This constantly use, uh, if you will, similitude <laughs> or allegorical or metaphor within the Baha'i writings that the manifestation of God is singular. That, that is the Word of God, the Spirit of God, the perfect reflection of God, yet appears in multiple lamps, appears in many different mirrors at different times throughout history. That, that being is being expressed within the phenomenal world through different various temples, which are actually its only its appearance, only its manifestation. But the true reality of the being of Jesus Christ is unfathomably transcendent over that which we see on the historical plane. So when we look at the Quran and we see this difference between the type, which in this case would be the type fruit or type you know, uh, bovine, <laughs> or the type which is the message of God, eternal in the past and eternal in the future, we see the same notion that it itself is expressed, if you will, in the reality of our world in various different ways. Another common example is when we actually take a look at the concept of money. Do we find that there is money in the world? Yes, there is money. And now at the same time, when we actually look into what money can be, it can be paper, it can be coins, it can actually be gold, it can be silver. It is actually a unit of currency, the type of expression. It can even be shells or beads or large rocks. So it's not the physical manifestation, it's not the physicality of that thing that actually defines it as money, but it is actually the abstract use and function of that thing that gives us the category of money. Likewise, when Jesus Christ was crucified upon the cross, this was only a likeness of what he is. They did not kill Jesus Christ. Any more than all of which is pomegranate-ness, or the reality of the pomegranate, is actually destroyed by the eating of a single fruit. It continues to abide, although a token of it was destroyed. A similitude or appearance of the reality. Now while this might seem peculiar to some at first, there is no doubt that the New Testament is actually exceedingly clear that the reality of Jesus Christ is not remotely limited to his physical instantiation or embodiment upon the plane of history. This individual was with God in the beginning. He is the Word of God who came into the world. So that being, in the Gospels themselves, is actually a pre-existent entity. Just like for example, in the book of Proverbs, in chapter 8, we find the concept of wisdom itself existing in the beginning with God. Yet wisdom as a property abides, or if you will, manifests in the hearts and minds of men all throughout history. There is no way, for example, that you actually have destroyed generosity by preventing the generous act of an individual. Generosity, in my belief, is a moral property, a principle of our cosmos no different than the laws of nature in general. When we prevent an act of generosity, that itself does not kill generosity. 
That is only an appearance of generosity, that is a likeness of generosity. It is a symbol of generosity, an emblem. And in the destruction of that, we do not destroy, if you will, destroy the universal, the type. We have merely prevented an instance or token of it. And the same actually goes for any virtue, or for that matter, any intellectual property. If something is actually rational, and we destroy it, it's a cogent, logical, rational argument. When we destroy that instance of it, we do not destroy rationality itself. We do not destroy cogency itself. It is something that is truly, in the words of Abdu'l-Bahá, the term he uses, an intangible. That intangible is just like Jesus Christ himself. Yes, we encounter, if you will, the Logos, the Word of God, the manifestation, in the person of the Buddha. We find him in the person of the Prophet Muhammad, in the person of Jesus Christ. Yet it is not limited to that singular instance, that singular token, for the reality of Jesus Christ and the manifestation of God is, for lack of a better term, an abstract and intangible reality that manifests itself upon the plane of history. I believe that the Quran, when we actually go through the passages of the uses of this verb in many of its different forms, which is actually derived from these three literal, literal roots, Shabaha, that we find in each of these cases it is touching upon this subject of the difference between a type and a token, between a reality and a manifestation of that reality, or if you will, an appearance or likeness of that reality. There is no way that Jesus Christ, in what Jesus Christ really and truly was, was actually crucified and killed. It is impossible, and I would suggest it's impossible, even according to the Bible, because his reality was not annihilated or destroyed or killed. And, as I said, we have seen this same fruit in similitude that unites the various messages, the other use in the Quran, of that one message, that one type, the faith of God, eternal in the past and eternal in the future, we have seen this same fruit within the Book of Wisdom that no Jew or no Muslim would ever take as meaning that the righteous never actually died. They would say, yes, of course they were crucified, of course they were tortured, of course on the surface, in appearance, in likeness, it seems like they were killed or crucified or beheaded or tortured or degraded. But in reality, they are not. They are with their Lord at peace. Thank you very much, my friends.